Hey, this is Jason Falls. Hey, this is Mari Smith. Hey, everybody, this is CC Chapman. Hey, this is Jason Keith. Michael Stelzner here. Hi there, I'm Rand Fishkin. Hey, this is John Jans. Hey, it's Jay Bear. Hey, this is Brian Solis. Hi, this is David Wells, and you're watching Inbound Now with, wait, no. Hi, this is Seth Godin, and you're watching Inbound Now with David Wells. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Inbound Now. I have a very special guest with me here today, Mr. Kip Bodner from HubSpot. Welcome to the show, Kip. Thank you, thank you for having me, Mr. Wells. How's it going today? It's going great, it's going great. I've been waiting to get you on the show, Kip. I wasn't, I didn't forget about you. I, I was, you know, saving the best for, you know, later, right, so. Uh, you have a full agenda, I understand. I, I just, now that I'm here though, I promise that I won't disappoint. Absolutely, absolutely. And Kip, I just read your book, the B2B social media book, Becoming a Marketing Superstar by Generating Leads with Blogging, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Email, and more. Long that, title. <laughs> Long title. That is a mouthful, but it was a great, fantastic read, and I got a ton of questions here to toss at you. So you ready to go? Bring them on. I, I'm ready for him. All right, cool, cool. So in the beginning of the book, you talk about why B2B companies are actually better at social media than B2C companies. Can you explain your thought process behind that? Sure, yeah. I mean, there's this cl classic myth out there that B2C companies are where it's at when it comes to social media. B2B companies, really, they, they should stick to the trade shows and that kind of stuff. And that, that's wrong because unlike B2C companies, B2B companies, they have clear buyer personas. They know who they're talking to. They can create content and engage with people in a way that is much more relevant and uh, kind of based on what their customer actually wants, as opposed to the B2C folks who are kind of just guessing. And you know, in addition to that, B2B companies have always kind of been content creators. A lot of the big B2B companies used to have quarterly magazines and these elaborate newsletters. And so they, they're in the mindset of creating content already, which is a key part of social media. So historically, B2B companies have kind of already been positioned for success. It's really just about kind of understanding how what they've been doing applies to kind of an interactive online channel like social. So uh, they're in a really good position to take advantage. Gotcha, gotcha. And and would would you say there's a first mover advantage as well? Like if uh you know an industry is kind of on the edge about social media, would you say like jump in now? Yeah, I mean the web rewards first movers, right? I mean there's only kind of one winner on the web. You know Google is the definitive winner in search. eBay is the kind of the definitive winner in like marketplaces online. There's right. all these people that kind of win, and so you want to be the winner for your industry. And you do that by establishing a strong social presence, building a community, and building out a backlog of blog content, website content that fuels this big inbound machine that's going to bring you traffic and leads. Gotcha, gotcha. Cool. So you also say, you know, sometimes social media isn't right for some B2B companies. What, what scenarios are, are those? Yeah, dude, I, I love to be super practical. Like, so, social media isn't going to solve everything. It's, gonna, it's not going to make every business better. You know, if you're this, like, really niche B2B company and there are, like, five companies in the world that can buy your product and you're cool with just serving those five companies, then social media isn't that interesting. I'm not saying it could work or isn't applicable, but I'm saying things like face-to-face -face meeting, really customized direct mail, other things like that are probably going to work much at, at a much higher rate and be more efficient in, in terms of gaining and retaining customers than social media would. So there's so some of those kind of very niche scenarios when you're after such a small part of the market where social media doesn't make a lot of sense. And if you're trying, you know, if you're trying for a really high velocity too, like if you're trying to sell something in the next 90 days and that's all you, the window you have to make a lot of cash, Social media is not the right thing. Social media is a good long-term strategy that's going to serve you well six months from now, but even better a year from now and kind of build over time. But if you're looking only for the short term, it's not going to be a good solution for you. Companies jumping in, do you think they should go across the broad spectrum, you know, have a presence on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, like hit all bases at once, or should they really focus in, and, and some places are right and some places aren't for that company? You know, I think it depends on the business. I think there are some, com I think companies should start with what works, especially, you know, in B2B, obviously LinkedIn is still kind of king. And, you know, we've done research at HubSpot and obviously found that traffic from LinkedIn converts into leads at a higher rate than traffic from Facebook or Twitter or other sources. So starting with LinkedIn makes complete sense. But that's not to be said, that's not to say that you can't 
gener generate leads and customers effectively through Facebook. You totally can. You want to prioritize. If you have the, the time and ability to do all of them, great. If not, start with something you know is going to be successful like LinkedIn. Speaking of social media lead generation, you know, you have a whole section of the book about how, you know, when you get your, your target audience off of those social channels onto your website, you're talking about converting them through like calls to action and stuff like that. And you mentioned that content isn't king, context is king. Right. What, what do you mean by that? So people, there's this myth in marketing that content like rules everything. If you have content, you fix everything. Uh, content is really important part of, of inbound and social and, and bringing people to your website. But you've got to convert people. And you convert people by being very contextual, serving them something that they really want. You know, if, 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 you, if somebody finds your article on... Uh, on steel ball bearings, but your call to action in that article is for somebody to go learn more about sheet metal, that's not very contextual. You want, some, you want to highly align your content with your offers, your call to actions to generate leads. So if you're writing a blog post on steel ball bearings, you want an ebook, e a webinar, a, a, an offer that's going to be highly related to that, highly contextual to that content so that you can convert that person and get them into the, to the sales cycle and start working that lead. Gotcha, gotcha. So, so let's talk about what has worked really well for, for you guys at HubSpot. You know, there's there's tons of different ways to do it. You know, you can create eBooks, white papers, webinars, like you mentioned. What have you seen that works best? Yeah, I, I mean, it it's all across the board. Uh, eBooks and white papers are always great. I mean, regardless of industry, webinars work really well. I think you can oversaturate webinars. There are a lot of people doing webinars these days, which means attendance rates are lower. It's harder to get people to attend them. So you've got to be careful there. But you also want to have you know, secondary offers. You want to have things like product demonstrations and co free consultations and everything to kind of pick out the serious buyers from that initial kind of top of the funnel lead generation offer. So you want to have a mix of both. Um, obviously on the web people are always looking to learn more so starting with something like an ebook or a white paper is always going to be a winner. Gotcha, gotcha. And do you guys focus on creating your content offers around like more evergreen content where it has a longer shelf life or do you go after something very very pertinent to that you know kind of time frame? Right, I think it's both. I think both are really important. I think they're having an ebook that's relevant six months from now is really important but if you have something really important news wise that happens in your industry, a piece of legislature or a, a, a new offering that impacts your industry, you, you want to be the first person to kind of distill what that means for the industry into some written content and, and publish that and get that out in ebook form it's going to resonate really well. It's highly contextual. It's highly relevant. You're going to convert a lot of people, but you're also that stuff doesn't happen all the time. That stuff may happen once a month or once a year, depending on the industry. And so you want to kind of balance that with more evergreen offers, like you're talking about. Gotcha, gotcha, cool, cool. So switching gears a little bit to blogging, because I know you're a blogging expert. You run the HubSpot blog, which gets tons and tons and tons of traffic. Um, in chapter seven in your book, you you say that. People are already blogging experts. What do you yes. mean? What do you mean by that? Like most people know how to do blogging well, they just don't connect the pieces, right? Most marketers understand how to tell a really compelling story. That's why they're in marketing. They're, they're, they're good at communicating with their target audience, telling them a story. What they what normally gets in their way from a blogging standpoint is getting too caught up in, in product knowledge, getting being too precious about their work, being afraid to kind of publish a blog post and move on to the next one. Instead, they'll kind of review and edit a post to death, and you know it'll be two weeks before it actually gets published. So they're just little things like that that marketers have to kind of t teach and train themselves on. But the nuts and bolts of telling a good story and, and doing so in a really interesting and relevant way for your audience is something that every marketer is great at. So it's just the, it's fixing the little things to get really good at blogging. Right, right. And in the book you mentioned, you know, the, the core... Uh, facets of being a marketer today are, you know, that that storyteller aspect, and then also being data driven. Absolutely. So, speaking of being data driven, let's you know dive into kind of the elephant in the room that a lot of people are talking about, and that's social media ROI, right? It's right. Still, totally. It still seems to be a mystery to most. Um, but in the chapter, or in in a couple of chapters in the book, actually, you you go through it in detail. So mm -hmm. you talk about the concept of having a closed-loop marketing system. What does that mean? 
you know, if you're a B2B company, you need to be able to attribute ROI to all of your marketing channels. And on the web, that basically just means you have to know where your lead came from and you need to kind of tag that lead and track that lead throughout the sales process. So you need a way to, okay, you need software, something like HubSpot. There are lots of other awesome competitors out there, lots of software that will do this for you, right? I can't remember that, their name right now, but... That, you, you know, uh, there, there are lots of awesome ones. The Googles is your friend. Um, but that being said, you know, you people come in, you know, somebody finds your website via Twitter. If you're going with the first action attribution model, then if they find your website for the first time via Twitter, that person, whenever they convert, maybe they convert off of a, a paid ad or, or something else, whenever they convert, they'll still be attributed back to Twitter because that's how they originally found you. And that person will be marked as a Twitter lead throughout the process and as that lead information gets passed to a, a CRM system like Salesforce or Sugar or something like that then you know that lead gets work you can look at the data throughout the sales process and you can also more importantly know if that person became a customer because what you want to do at the end of the day is say I invested this amount of money in terms of time and effort on something like LinkedIn and it netted me X amount of revenue and you want to balance that out right right <coughs> So when you're talking about, you know, looking at the attribution source, there's two different ways to look at it, right? The first attribution, so they initially saw that tweet on Twitter, maybe came in, then actually became a customer, and then the last touch point. So maybe they saw the tweet, came in, and then, you know, three weeks later, downloaded a white paper or something like that. Mm -hmm. So which one is more important and which one uh, is what you guys look at? Well, I mean, I think it's super important and interesting to look at both. Um, I think both are really valuable. Um, we focus a lot on the first action attribution, how they originally found you, because that kind of measures intent and kind of shows you how your top of the funnel marketing is really working. And, and then we'll, we'll measure the middle of our funnel marketing, our sales enablement, our lead nurturing, all those things via some different metrics and map ROI to them differently. But we're talking about kind of top of the funnel using social media for lead gen. That first action attribution to see how people are originally finding you via social, I think is the most accurate way to kind of map ROI back to your marketing efforts. Gotcha, gotcha. And, and in the ROI equation that you give in the book, you know, it's the cost of customer acquisition and the total lifetime value um, divided by like one minus the other. I'll put the equation in the. Uh, it's it, it, it's cost customer acquis. It's it's total lifetime value minus cost of customer acquisition over cost of customer acquisition. Gotcha, Gives gotcha. you a percent formula. So. So you know how can social media help lower the cost of cu customer acquisition? Right. So customer acquisition is basically all the sales and marketing costs that go involved that that are involved in bringing a, a customer on board and 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 being a paying customer for your business. So you've sales commission and things like that, which you know marketing doesn't have that much control over. But what marketing does have control over is kind of the scale in which it acquires customers. You know, if you do direct mail and you pay for a list and you pay for mailing, you know, depending on the response rate, you'll have a certain cost per customer there. Through social is a much more scalable scalable thing. So you educate customers, which can help lengthen or shorten the sales cycle and do some interesting things there. But it also provides this scale where if you, you know, if you publish a blog post today, that blog post is going to generate leads today, but it's also going to generate leads 12 months from now through search, through resharing on social media, through all these things. And those leads over time, you know, that that lowers the cocoa because you only spend that time and effort and resource to create that blog post once but you get the value from it as kind of an annuity over time. Gotcha, gotcha. So it, so it is an annuity just like you know all of inbound marketing, content creation, Absolutely. SEO, you know, what have you. So interesting, interesting. So on the flip side to that question, you know, on the, you know, total lifetime value of the customer, what are some ways that social media can increase that that total lifetime value? Right. So total lifetime value is really about keeping a customer around long a long time getting them to buy multiple times or if you're a subscription based business like not you know prolonging their cancellation having them be happy month over month and so what normally makes a great customer is a really well educated customer that has reasonable expectation and is satisfied with the product and service they get and social media is about most of those things right social media does a great job at, at educating your customers pre-sale so 
that as they're going through the sales and marketing process, they're actually getting educated as opposed to something like direct mail, which is just trying to go for that immediate action. So when they actually buy and become a customer, they have a much better expectation and level of ex education, which is going to increase their likelihood that they're going to be a happy customer and obviously pay you more money over time. Right, right. And, and would you say that there's opportunity to kind of cross-sell or upsell other, you know, companies? Oh, absolutely. There's a whole, you know, a whole other book of talking about using social media f for nurturing existing customers and to retain, but also upsell and, and drive more revenue from existing customers. There's a, a tons of opportunity there. Gotcha, gotcha. Cool, cool. So what would some advice for, uh, you know, some people out there watching right now, they're like, oh, this, all this sounds great, social media B2B, you know, we, we know we want to be there, but upper management is, you know, they're old school, they don't believe in it. You know, what would you say to those people that are getting pushback in their company? Totally, well, first of all, make it all about leads, because leads are about revenue, right? Leads are a proxy for revenue, leads are what you're gonna give your sales team, they're gonna turn those into customers, so make whatever social media that you're proposing about leads because executives understand leads and revenue. And then the second way to kind of be successful is propose a test. Say, you know, I, I want 90 days or I want six months and if we accomplish X, generating a certain amount of leads, something like that, then, I, then we'll continue and continue to invest more in this program. Tests are a little less scary for folks because um, they're not committing to a big organizational change just yet. They're committing to a test that if it validates and works well, then it's not as a scary of a change as they might perceive it. So, you know, focus on leads and offer a test. Gotcha, gotcha. So when you guys are, you know, one of the things you mentioned in the book is setting benchmarks, right? So the only way to really see if something's working is by setting out benchmarks at the, at the start, right, of to see if you actually meet those goals or, or what have you. How do you guys go about setting your goals and, and making them realistic? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a challenge, you know, there, there's lots of data available, so you need to look, you know, whether it's uh, software companies, whether it's analyst firms, there are lots of folks out there that have data around how marketers perform in different industries and for different tactics, and you need to take a little time, aggregate that, and understand, you know, what a good click-through rate is for your industry, what a good, um, you know, blog readership is like for your industry and understand all of these kind of key metrics so that you can understand, you know, what portion of that, how close you're going to get to that as you, during your test period. So I call it kind of understanding what good is. Like, tell me, you know, once you know what good is, you can kind of have something to work towards, and that helps with the goal setting, especially in kind of the testing phase. Gotcha, gotcha. Cool, cool. So, Kip, what are some of your favorite social media resources that, you know, you've used over the years to really kind of hone in on this stuff and become an expert? Tons of awesome stuff out there. Um, you know, the, Michael Stelzner and the guys at Social Media Examiner do a fantastic job. Jason Falls at Social Media Explorer, a huge fan of what the folks at Marketing Profs, Anne Hanley and her team, are fantastic. Um, I, I love what's happening, you know, at Mashable and the Next Web, and obviously, I love what we do at HubSpot. I love what we do at Social Media B two B, which is my my personal blog. I love what David's doing in Bell Now. Awesome. Hey, uh, but you know there are lots of lots of really good sources out there. Um, just you know, check them all out and, and measure and kind of understand what's best for you, and then keep a couple in your back pocket that you're going to refer to. And then there's Marketing Sherpa, E Consultancy. There's lots of good stuff out there. Cool, cool. So, so last and final random question. Yes. Would you recommend that people invest in Facebook stock now that they've IPO'd? Random question. Why? Right? Hmm. I still think it, I still think it's overvalued. He's asked me a random question. I'm going to give him a serious answer. I still think Facebook stock is a little overvalued. I thought the $38 per share at the IPO was a little high. I would have loved to see it in the mid 20s. I still think it stands to drop a little bit. I don't know if it's going to go below 30, but I would kind of wait. You know, once if it, if it got down 30 and some change, or ever dropped below 30, I'd probably put a buy on it. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm turning the show into a uh, social media stock show, so it's hey, that, that's, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy to weigh in with my conjecturing. With, with all these IPOs. Cool. So, Kip, where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, at, at Kip Bodner on Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn. Happy to connect with you there. You can find me at socialmediab2b.com. Uh, you can find the book, the B2B Social Media Book at Amazon, and you can obviously find lots of my blog posts and content on HubSpot.com and blog.hubspot.com. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Kip, thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time, and thanks for the social media ROI tips. Absolutely. Thanks, David.